Well, good morning. morning. Great to see you all. Time for Leviticus. So, uh, you can join me in opening your Bible to Leviticus chapters 21 and 22. Um, One of the assumptions and things we mention uh, throughout the months at our church is that we believe Christians should know the Bible, should be reading the Bible, and should grow in understanding the Bible. Um, So we want to be a church filled with people who immerse themselves in God's Word. We believe that when we gather here on Sunday, we're hearing God's Word as it's read. We're hearing it when it's preached faithfully, and we're opening God's Word together. Uh, We also want to be reading God's Word alone with friends, with family, talking about it in small groups, and so forth. Um, And so Leviticus is part of this. So one of the goals of a sermon series is to help us understand Leviticus for the rest of our life when we read through the Bible um, and not give up in a Bible reading plan or not skip it or not just try to plow through it, but actually receive it as God's Word. Another reason why we're in this book is for uh, a reason why, you know, Christians refer to apologetics. So it's answering people's honest questions about Christianity and the Bible and Jesus. And so we want to give honest answers. And so some people dismiss Christianity outright and Jesus because of Leviticus because this is in the Bible. Um, And so what we're doing is we're taking it chapter by chapter, seeing that this is not boring. Um, Leviticus has certainly not been boring. It's not impossible to understand. It's not morally suspect. Um, It's actually relevant for modern people. It's filled with rituals and symbols and sacrifices. But what we're seeing throughout this series is when we grasp the big picture, this is actually very relevant and morally compelling. And the key is understanding that God is setting up a, um, a symbol-laden world for Israel. And the key to understanding the symbolism of, of this world he's giving them in Leviticus is Eden. So that perfect world in the beginning. So the whole setup portrays, we've been seeing week after week, the beauty and perfection of Eden. When humanity was right with God and right with one another and the world was all as it should be, we've lost that because of our sin. And so now the world is broken and flawed in every area. But the story of the Bible is the story of God's grace to restore this world. And so one of the ways that God unfolds this story is by giving Israel a temporary symbol-laden system and world to live within. And that symbolic system functioned like a drama that they were participating in and enacting. So everything was part of this drama. The tabernacle, right, that tent in the middle of Israel's land, or life together that then later became the temple in the land, the sacrifices, the priests, their calendar, the feasts, all of it was part of a drama that was to portray God's plan to restore sinners to himself and then restore all things. So Leviticus is about God's plan to one day bring an ideal world. And Leviticus is a symbolic portrayal of that coming new world. So as you think of what an ideal world would be, what would it look like? What's the kind of world that everyone's longing for? Well, one word I think that gets at what we long for is wholeness. We long for a world that's not broken, damaged, has gaps. We long for bodies that aren't breaking down. We want relationships that are no longer strained through either conflict or disassociation. We want a world without the pain and sorrow of death and loss. And so this morning, our text focuses on how the ideal world is a world of holiness and wholeness. Holiness refers to a life devoted to God that reflects his moral beauty. Wholeness is connected to this because God's plan is not just for people to be holy, devoted to him, reflecting his moral beauty, but whole, to have restored and whole bodies and relationships. So Leviticus called Israel to live out a symbol-laden drama portraying a holy and whole world. Leviticus 21 and 22 focuses in particular on how priests were to guard this drama. 
So when you think about what the priests were to do in the Old Testament, I think we often are familiar with, well, they offered sacrifices. Uh, We're less familiar with their role of teaching, but they did that as well, and they served in the tabernacle. One of their primary functions was to guard the drama, to protect it and its clarity for God's people. They were to guard the holiness and wholeness that the drama was all about. They were responsible for preserving the clarity of this dramatic presentation until Jesus came. So we're looking at Leviticus 21 and 22. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one under the chairs near you. It's on page 99. We'll just read chapter 21 together. It's a pretty long text. Um, And then we'll walk through the two uh, chapters at a higher level. So here's Leviticus 21. This is God's word. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people, except for his closest relatives, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, or his virgin sister who's near to him because she's had no husband. For her he may make himself unclean. He shall not make himself unclean as a husband among his people and so profane himself. They shall not make bald patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beard, nor make cuts on their body, right? These pagan mourning rites at the time. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the Lord's food offerings, the bread of their God, therefore they shall be holy. They shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who's been defiled. Neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband. For the priest is holy to his God. You shall sanctify him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. And the daughter of of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire, likely killed first, then burned. The priest who is chief among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who's been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. Again, these symbols of mourning. He shall not go into any dead bodies or make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary, lest he profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his, of his God is on him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman, or a woman who's been defiled, or a prostitute. These he shall not marry. But he shall take as his wife a virgin of his own people, that he may not profane his offspring among his people, for I am the Lord who sanctifies him. Verse 16, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, None of your offspring throughout their generations, who has a blemish, may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near, a man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a defect in his sight or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles. No man of the offspring, we're not going to talk too detailed about all these, but this is God's words. This is why we're reading this in Leviticus in a culture like ours. What in the world does this mean? No man of the offspring of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to offer the Lord's food offerings since he has a blemish. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, boast of the most holy and the holy things. But he shall not go through the veil or approach the altar because he has a blemish, that he may not profane my sanctuaries, for I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all the people of Israel, and then it goes on. So we read this, and many people have been offended by this text. Um, and it could be easy to skip over this, or it could be easy to read it. Like, let's just go to chapter 22. Um, but it's important that we read God's Word and we understand it. And what I find fascinating about this text is that when we understand this in its context, it's actually not offensive. It's the opposite. It's hope-giving. So I want to make that case to you this morning. So this text is about how priests were to guard the drama. Now, not everyone thinks that's what this chapter is about. I just want to say out front. So some think it's about standards for church leaders because this is about priests, and they're clearly giving high standards here for the broad category of holiness. 
And so some would see that priests are called to these high standards of respecting God and his holy things. And so the main point today would be for pastors, church leaders, to take their role seriously, revere God and his things. I think that misses what this chapter is all about. Here's what I want to propose is the main idea of the text. The priests are to guard the drama. They guard the symbol-laden drama that portrays an ideal world. And they do this because this is portraying the hope of a renewed world that's coming, a world of holiness and wholeness. So they are cultivating hope in the coming new creation that we all long for, and because the priests need to guard this drama, these commands are given. So how is this relevant to us? Well, in one sense, we're still waiting for the fulfillment of this ideal world to come. The new creation that this drama portrays is still ahead of us. So we're looking forward to the world of holiness and wholeness. But this drama back in Leviticus is still meant to kindle hope because we are still God's people longing for this. But there's also a sense in which the reality of this drama in Leviticus has begun to be fulfilled. Jesus has already come and brought the fulfillment of this. He's launched the new creation in the middle of history. He's renewing our lives spiritually and morally. He's the first one with a resurrection body, guaranteeing that our bodies will be made whole one day. He's making us now holy and whole. And he's made all of his people priests. So this is a connection now that's relevant to us as well. So if you're a Christian, you have a role in guarding the holiness that we are longing for to be fulfilled in the new creation to come. So here's the message for us. Because Jesus has made his people a priesthood, we preserve holiness as we hope in the new creation. So the priests in Leviticus preserve the symbolic holiness, that's what we'll see, but we now preserve the reality of holiness that's come in Jesus. So we'll walk through this text and see four ways that priests are to guard the drama by preserving holiness and wholeness. And as we see these, we'll stop at each one and see how they did this in a symbolic way, and we now live in the fulfillment of this. So four pictures that the priests were to guard. The pictures of life, wholeness, feasting, and a perfect sacrifice. So that's what we'll see here. So first, priests guard the picture of life. So the world that God will restore one day is a world of life. It's a world where, the, where there will be no more death, no more tears, no more crying. That's how the Bible ends. He's making all things new. Now the tabernacle, this tent that was to be set up in the middle of Israel's life, portrayed that world of life. So the tent we've seen is a mini symbolic Eden. It's in their midst, so the priests who serve in it are to preserve that part of the drama. So for generations, Israel was to see this drama enacted before their eyes of the priests serving in the tabernacle, and it was a picture of a world without death. So how did the priests preserve that for these coming generations of Israel? Well, they did this in part by avoiding association with death while they served. So this is one of the main emphases of the first section we read. The priests are given requirements regarding mourning for death. So verse 1, no one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people. So that's the key idea here. Having contact with a dead body would make a priest symbolically unclean for a time. And this is because death is associated with this fallen world in its current state from Genesis 3. Almost all the things that make someone ritually unclean in Leviticus are connected back to Genesis 3 in the story of how this world got plunged into its current broken, chaotic state. So Adam and Eve sinned, then Genesis 3 gives the consequences. And one central consequence of sin is death, and that's now part of the world. But now God, for Israel, is creating this drama to portray a restored world that's coming. So he says that touching death will make a priest who's a cast, or cast in this drama, it will make him unclean for a time. So if you're unclean as a priest, you essentially get a timeout from the drama. You can't portray 
the world of life that's coming because you are stained with and tainted with death. So if you're a priest, you have to avoid this. So the priest can't attend funerals except for very close family members, and those were listed there. So those are exceptions, and that's kind. But then the requirements are ratcheted up for the high priest. He can't give any signs of mourning death, even for the closest family members. It says even for his father and mother. This is verses 10 and 12. You can read it again with me. The priest who is chief among his brothers, so this is the high priest, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who's been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let his hair, the hair of his head, hang loose, nor tear his clothes, these acts of mourning. He shall not go into any dead bodies, nor make himself unclean, even for his father or mother. The high priest is to be a picture of Adam and Eden, of humanity and the new creation, a picture of life untouched, unstained by death and its sadness. So this section also has guidelines for who a priest can marry. These requirements essentially have to do with preserving the priestly line. So they can't marry a divorced woman or prostitute because the line is to say, stay uncomplicated in Israel's history. So others could do that. But the priests, they have to have an uncomplicated family line because they're the guardians of the drama. So priests are cast as actors here and their role is to represent a new humanity brought back into God's presence. And so it's a drama of when God will bring us back to himself and death will be no more. And they're to do this and preserve it so that every generation in Israel, until Jesus came, would see this picture so it would cultivate hope. So what does this mean for us? Well, I mentioned this has wrongly been applied directly or mainly to pastors, the application would be that pastors need to prioritize God even over family. So just like the priest couldn't mourn uh, death and things like this, pastors have to be above that. They have to prioritize God over family, be divorced from the normal things of the world and things like that. That's really not the point. The point that I'm arguing is that the priest had a specific role in this drama of hope. They're not to grieve death because the day is coming when death is no more. And so this is meant to cultivate hope for us still today. A day is coming when Jesus Christ will return and death will be no more. We read about it this morning. The earth will be renewed. We'll live in a new heavens and a new earth. We'll be with God in a realm of life. And this drama cultivates hope in that. And there's good news for us even now because Jesus has brought that reality already in part. So when he came... He grieved over Lazarus' death, his friend, and he made him rise. He touched, I mean, Jesus, the high priest of all high priests, he touched dead bodies. But he didn't become unclean and stained by death. He made them come alive. He was pushing out death to bring the life of the world to come. That's what he came to do. He was picturing it constantly in his life and ministry to show that even though he's just doing it with a few individuals here and there in his ministry, he said, this is what I'm coming to do. This is what he'll one day bring in its full. So he's now raising us spiritually from the dead, and we look forward to the resurrection of the bodies to come. So that's the first picture of the priesthood of God, the picture of life. Second, they guard the picture of wholeness. So now this is one of the most intriguing texts in all of Leviticus. It's actually one of my favorite parts. When people first read this, they're typically offended by it, uh, but it's because they don't yet see what's really going on in this text. So when we understand verses 16 to 24 here, in context, it's actually the opposite of offensive. It's actually hope-giving. So I want to explain this. In 16 to 24, those verses in chapter 21 here, it addresses the topics of priests that have some kind of physical blemish or problem. It says that they are not allowed to go beyond the veil into the tabernacle to offer the bread. And it seems totally offensive at first. Look at verse 18. No one who has a blemish shall draw near to God. A man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot or hand and so forth. It lists 12 examples, 12 being a number that's probably just meaning representative, a representative list because this isn't exhaustive. There's more. Any priest with any kind of issue is excluded 
from going in to the tabernacle and offering the bread. What is going on here? Well, how is this actually not offensive? Well, here's four observations. The fourth one is the key one. First, this only applies to the priests. All the other Israelites were already excluded from being able to do this. So in Israel, only the men of a certain age, of a certain family line, the line of Aaron, were allowed to serve like this. So it's already a very select few people who can go into the tabernacle. Second, these priests who have physical issues are actually honored and privileged above other ordinary Israelites in perfect health. So these are, they're still priests. They're still allowed to serve. They're still acceptable to God and regarded as holy. They're honored above the most physically fit, ordinary Israelite. Third, the limitation here for them is actually very specific. This is not saying that they can't be priests. They are priests. They can serve as priests. They just can't enter the holy place here to offer the bread in the tabernacle. Okay, now fourth, and this is the key observation. The rationale is, no surprise, the symbolic drama. So this is a way of preserving the prophetic drama of a perfect world. So the priests are to preserve the symbolism of the life in Eden. So this picture that the priests are presenting is of wholeness, right? God is going to restore the world. They're cast as characters in a drama. They play the role of a renewed humanity in God's presence in a new creation. So we just need to remember then that what's going on here is the tabernacle itself is this mini Eden, a picture of God with humanity again. It's an ideal world. Everything's fixed. Everything's right. Everything's ideal. The curse is removed. So the priests, when they enter there, are to be symbolic pictures of wholeness. So here's the question. Why then could the injured or the disabled or the deformed not enter? Because their bodies recall the effects of the curse on this world. Now here's what's amazing. Once we see this, it's the opposite of offensive. This is actually an incredible affirmation of the value of those humans with disabilities. It's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible to give hope to those with broken bodies. Here's why. Because the whole point is that God is going to fix this. The whole drama is for those with disabilities and injuries and have failing bodies as they get older and older because it's saying one day you will be raised with a new body. One day you will live in a world without disabilities, no injuries, no broken bodies. My brother Tyler, if you've been here a number of years, you know he uh, had severe disabilities. He was born with a heart problem and ended up having severe uh, brain damage. Such a wonderful, precious brother. Lived about four decades, and yet through those four decades, I never had a normal conversation with him because he couldn't talk. Hard to know what's going on in his mind. And yet he made everyone's life better who knew him. And yet we grieve over the brokenness of his brain and his body. He lived and yet couldn't enjoy the things that so many can enjoy. So we trust in God's goodness and sovereignty. We trust that God had a plan, and part of his plan included him, Tyler, being severely disabled. And we saw so much good that has come and still comes from his life that he had. But we also grieve the brokenness. It's not the way it was supposed to be. We look forward to the resurrection. That's our hope. It's the hope of renewal. Now, you still may think, well, I mean, why not let the priests like this in to the drama? Why not let them with physical, who have physical issues still go in and serve? It feels exclusive. 
So think of it like this. Picture a group of men on the front lines in the trenches of World War I. They've been in the trenches for a while. So many of them are bruised and bloodied. Their uniforms are filthy and tattered. One of them can hardly walk because he's so worn out. Some are injured and needing to be taken off the line permanently. And then these soldiers have a stretch of a few weeks of relief. And so one of them has an idea. Why not, why don't we put on a musical drama for the other soldiers? And especially those who are in the hospital right now. And let's do it to portray life at home again. And it'll be to cultivate hope in all of us. Hope in them of what life will be like, closer to what it'll be like when they're back home. So they need to pick a few guys to do the acting. Who do they pick? Well, they look around and they see Joe, who got a fresh pair of boots and new uniform. He looks cleaned up. They see Fred and Paul and see that they're kind of full of vigor. And so they have those three guys put on this drama to sing and dance. Now, why were they chosen? Not because they're better than other people, but because for the drama, the particular drama, they are a closer glimpse of what life outside the war is like and will be like. So they don't pick the tired and the tattered and the injured ones for the drama because it wouldn't communicate the hope clearly enough. And then they take their drama into the hospital to give hope to the injured. So the point isn't that those in the hospital are excluded from participating in the drama. The point is hope and encouragement. The point is encouragement. So this gets at something, not a one-to-one -one, of course, something though of the dynamic that's going on here in Leviticus. So how does this relate to us now? Well first this still cultivates hope in the new creation. So we look at the drama and we can see where it's all heading. We're headed to a new creation. All of those who trust in Jesus Christ, follow him, are following him on the way to a day of new bodies. We'll be made whole. There will be no crutches. There will be no casts. There will be no wheelchairs in the new creation. Doctors will be out of work. We won't need glasses. I won't need these contacts. Neurological problems will be fixed. Muscle and bone structural issues will be fixed. That's our hope. And Jesus came to show that this is, in fact, where the drama is heading. So Israel enacted this drama century after century after century, and then Jesus came because he said it's time for fulfillment. And have you noticed how much Jesus was drawn to those who had disabilities? I mean, we saw that when we walked through the Gospel of Mark, if you had been with us the past couple of years. Um, constantly, I mean... When we think of him going around in his ministry, we think, oh yeah, he did a lot of miracles. And we can just think, yeah, like, like tricks, miracles, crazy cool things. What was he doing? He was healing those with disabilities and injuries and broken bodies. That's what he was doing. Because he was saying, this is why I'm here. This is where the story's heading. He was healing disabled people and people with physical problems. So in Luke 14... He starts talking about this coming new creation as a wedding feast. And then right after that, he tells this parable of a great banquet. And he says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. That's whom he invites. Jesus loves those who have physical problems because he came to give the hope of resurrection. So the story is not meant to offend those with injuries, weaknesses, disabilities. It's meant to tell them that they are so loved by God and so seen by him and known by him that he will heal them one day. So Jesus has come and he's made all of his people priests. So we now, as priests, guard this picture still by cultivating hope. We guard this by honoring those who have physical challenges. We guard this by expressing the love of Christ to those who are currently disabled. Some of you do this so well. You serve those with special needs in your vocation. 
or you have a disability, and yet you also reach out in selfless service to others who have injuries or physical concerns or problems. Some of you serve a family member, child, parent, spouse, or you serve in our special needs class, or you intentionally treat those who have physical needs or challenges with great honor and dignity. And you, as you do that, you are a light shining in darkness that's picturing the light of the new creation to come. Be a little briefer on the, the last two pictures here, but still want to touch on them. So third, the third way that priests guard um, this picture is they guard the picture of feasting. So this next section into 22 focuses on how the priests preserve the drama by only eating holy food when they're clean. So the priestly food is only for priests' household holds and only for when priests are not unclean. So they have to be clean. That's the first 16 verses of chapter 22. We won't read details here, but the emphasis throughout the section is on these meals the priests eat. And so the question that is raised when we read this is why can priests only eat when they are ritually clean? And it's because the idea of being clean or unclean throughout Leviticus is connected to the symbolism of the fall. So things are unclean in Leviticus when they're associated in some way with the fallen world. So it goes back to some connection to Genesis 3. So animals that crawl on the ground, like the serpent of Genesis 3, are unclean. Or they're swarming on the ground, and the ground is cursed in Genesis 3. Or they're connected in some way to death, or some kind of skin disease that's decaying. It's like death on your body. It's the judgment of sin. So the priests are reminded that they can eat when they're not contaminated by some association with the fall in this symbolic way. Because the meals are meant to portray humanity feasting with God again. So they portray feasting with God. So they're enacting the drama of where history is headed. Now fourth, and finally, the priests guard the picture of a perfect sacrifice. So they preserve this dramatic image of a perfect sacrifice. Here we see the people... Uh, this is the second half of chapter 22. The people should only bring unblemished animals to be offered, and the priests should not accept any sacrifice of an animal that has a blemish. And the list of blemishes here is actually very similar to the list of blemishes that disqualify priests. So why does this matter? Well, one key reason is to preserve the symbolism of a perfect sacrifice coming for sin. So it shows the need for a perfect sacrifice for sin, so we're all flawed with our moral and spiritual blemishes, but the sacrifices could be offered to atone for our sin, and so the image is of a perfect sacrifice taking the place of imperfect people. So this points forward to the sacrifice of Jesus. He was the perfect priest who offers himself as a perfect sacrifice. He was without blemish. No sin, no moral corruption, no hypocrisy, no bad attitude, no moral flaws. And so he was offered on the altar of the cross. And we receive that work on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. So if you have not yet received the sacrifice of Jesus for your sins, you need to. Because you and I are flawed. We are not allowed to just waltz into God's presence. And one day we will stand before God. And what this drama is showing us is that God has given Jesus, his son, as a perfect sacrifice to take our place on the cross, to take hell for us, to take the judgment for us, so that we can be brought into his presence. And so the priests guarded this image by making sure that the sacrifices were unblemished. So if you want to get into the new creation to come, you have to go through the sacrifice of Jesus. Just like if you were to want to go into the tabernacle, you have to go right past through, in a sense, that altar with the perfect sacrifices. You don't get to God without going through the sacrifices as a sinner. And so we don't get to the new creation except going through the cross of Jesus. So those are the four ways the priests guard the purity of the drama that they're enacting. They guard the picture of life, so they don't associate with death when they serve. They guard the picture of wholeness, so they don't allow those who are physically broken and damaged to offer the bread in that particular act. 
They guard the picture of feasting with God so they don't eat when they become symbolically tainted by association with this cursed world. And they guard the picture of a perfect sacrifice. And so they only offer unblemished animals. So the priests are the guardians of the drama. And they would preserve this, ideally for every generation that would come, all the way to, the, to Christ's coming. And they did it to make clear that this is God's plan of redemption. This is what God's going to do for us. We will get Eden again, but even better. We'll be with God again. Our bodies will be renewed. We'll feast with him. No more death, no more disability. Sin will be no more. And so we now honor Jesus who brought this fulfillment and is bringing this fulfillment. He came as the true high priest. He gave eternal life. He healed the physically broken. He forgives sinners. He cleansed the unclean. He offers himself as the unblemished sacrifice. Do you see that this all is ultimately about Jesus and the world he brings? And then he rose again and he made his people priests. So if you are following Jesus, if you have received his sacrifice for your sins, you are now made a priest. And so you now have a role in guarding this continued drama as we wait for the new earth. So how do we do that now? How do you and I live as priests living out this role today? Well, here's three ways as we wrap up. First, we guard the reality of the drama. So in other words, we don't guard the drama's symbols anymore, but it's reality. We we do this by, I think, one way, preserving the clarity of the gospel. So just as the priests were to preserve the clarity of this symbolic vision, this symbolic drama of the gospel, we now preserve the clarity of its fulfillment now that it's come in Jesus. So this means we get clear on the gospel message of Jesus, we stay clear on it, we clarify it for one another, we teach it to our children, we articulate it to friends. We take it to the nations. So what's the gospel? Well, it's the story of how Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and coming return fulfills all of this drama, that he came for sinners. So if you want to summarize it in four words, it would be this. God, there's one true and holy God who made us for his glory. Sin, we have all rejected him and become filled with moral and spiritual blemishes. We put ourselves at the center of our lives. Third would be Jesus. He came to restore and redeem us through his perfect life, his sacrifice of atonement, his resurrection and victory, and his return to renew all things. And then fourth would be response. We receive his grace by responding with repentance from sin and faith in Jesus. So guard the clarity of the gospel by never getting bored with it, by identifying false teaching and heresy, because we guard this gospel message like the priests of old guarded the communication of it through the drama. Second, we cultivate hope in that future restoration of all things that's coming. We do this especially as those who are sinners and sufferers. We do this as those who are unclean because of our sins but have been cleansed by Jesus. We do this as those who have physical deformities and disabilities and diseases, knowing that Jesus loves us and he will give us new bodies one day. And one way to cultivate this hope is to express the love of God even now. So we're to reflect the healing love of God to one another. So as God will redeem and restore all things and renew our bodies, we now, with that hope, begin to express that heart of Christ to those who do have severe physical needs. We look them in the eye. We treat them with dignity. We don't get tested in the womb and then abort them when we find out they're going to have physical challenges. We care for those who are aging in our lives as their bodies begin to decline because we live in a story where God loves those with physical problems and will renew us in the new creation to come. So we cultivate hope as we even live in a day where we reflect that love to one another. Finally, we, we guard true holiness in our lives. So the priests were mainly there to preserve a symbolic holiness in this chapter, in these chapters. But now that Jesus has come, we preserve a moral holiness. 
So in 1 Thessalonians 4, we read this, God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God, honor God in your body. So the priests guard the drama of holiness and holiness in these symbol-laden ways, but now we're his priests, and so we have this great privilege right now, this afternoon, this week, the rest of our lives, to guard the real holiness in heart and in life, the moral beauty um, in all of our lives. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Leviticus. We thank you for the drama that you gave Israel that was shining with hope of the coming of Jesus. And we thank you for this hope of restoration and life and feasting and wholeness and holiness. So we pray that this wouldn't just be a morning that we remember your grace and cultivate hope, but that this hope would be rekindled in our hearts this afternoon as we think of you and your word, and to be rekindled this week as we think about guarding the clarity of this wonderful gospel in the hope of the renewal of all things. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.